Good evening. My name is Mark Syme. I'm the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to our evening services for Sunday, September the 10th. Per usual, we'll sing a few songs, we'll observe the Lord's Supper, and I have a message for you that I hope will be beneficial and give you something to think about this evening. Here at Northfield, we sing out of the songbook, uh, Songs of Faith and Praise. Uh, if you have that book with you, it'd be great, especially if you're one of the members of our congregation you're attending. But if not, uh, I'll give you the name of the song so that you can either Google it or <coughs> have another book and uh, get a chance to sing along with us. The first song we will sing uh, this evening is number 991, This Is My Father's World. This is my father's world. <clears throat> This is my Father's world, and to the listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings, the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world. <coughs> I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, is and the wonders wrought. This is my Father's world, the birds their carols raise, the morning light, the lily white, declares their Maker's praise. This is my Father's world. I shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world. The bird me ne'er forget. Though the wrong seems of so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus, who died, shall be satisfied, and earth and hand be one. The next song will be number 826. 826, uh, the title is Father, We Thank Thee. 826, Father, We Thank Thee. Father, we thank Thee for the night. And for the blessed morning light, for rest and food and loving care, and all that makes the day so fair. Help us to do the things we should, to be to others kind and good. In all we do and work or play, to grow more loving every day. And before the Lord's Supper, we will sing number 366 by Christ Redeemed.
by Christ redeemed. By Christ redeemed in Christ restored, we keep the supper of the word and show the death of our dear Lord until he His body given in our stead, His seen in this memorial brand. And as we drink, we see the blood until He comes. And thus that dark betrayal night With the last advent we unite By one bright chain of loving right Until he comes we are instructed on the first day of the week to break bread together, that is, partake of the Lord's Supper. Uh, Jesus instituted uh, this supper the night in which he was betrayed. He went into the upper room with his disciples and he explained to them what was going to happen. And uh, the emblems were placed before them. It was bread and it was grape juice or fruit of the vine. And uh, there was symbology to all of this. Uh, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 reiterates this. The bread uh, was in token of his body, the fruit of the vine in token of his blood. And so as we gather around, we remember that uh, God in his infinite wisdom sent Jesus to us. He sent him to us, uh, not just to teach, not just to live the perfect life, but to die upon the cross for us. And so as we take of the bread and we take of the fruit of the vine, we remember Jesus and we remember how important uh, he is in our lives. Let's pray for the bread. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that Jesus was willing to give up his body for us. We can but to imagine the agony that he felt as he was nailed to the cross. And so as we partake of this bread, we remember that body in agony on the cross and what he went through that we might have eternal life. Bless us if we, as we partake. We pray it in his most holy name. Amen. The blood that Jesus shed was the blood that washes away our sins. It is the blood that allows grace to fall over us. And so as we partake, let's remember the blood that Jesus shed. Let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that Jesus was not just willing to give up his body, but willing to shed his blood. We understand of uh, that blood is that life-giving fluid that runs through our bodies that carries everything necessary to different parts of our bodies that we might live yet this blood just oozed from his body as his life waned help us to remember that as that blood went from his body that uh, soon he would give up his life that we might have life Help us to be thankful the blood that for the blood that washes away our sins. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. And we have set aside a time each Lord's Day to give back to the Lord that which we have been prospered. 
Uh, that's what this is all about. It's all about that uh, we have been prospered in this life. Help us to ever remember that. And help us to remember that we, when we give back to the Lord, we give back what was his in the beginning. Help us to indeed remember that we came into this world with nothing. We will leave it with nothing. But we can help do the Lord's will as Jesus laid out in the Great Commission that we would go into all the world and preach the gospel. Uh, we just pray that these monies would be used to uh, affect that commission that Jesus made. And that also that uh, we can meet the needs of those who indeed have need because this is one of the reasons that we give. Let's pray for the giving. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we have the opportunity to give. We have, we're so grateful that we have the desire to give. We just pray that those who utilize these monies will do so in a way that will further your kingdom here on earth. We pray that others will come to know the truth of your word and will have the opportunity to live with you eternally. Be with us as we give. Help us to understand that God indeed does love a cheerful giver. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. And we're going to sing one more song. It's a kind of a lively song. Number 957. It's called This World Is Not My Home. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know, you know I have no friend like you with heaven. I'm my own then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardon me, and now I onward go. I know we'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know, you know, I have no friend like you with heaven. I'm my own, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beg of me from heaven. Open door, I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. The song of sweetest praise is back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If Heaven's not my own, then Lord, what will I do? The angel beg of me from heaven's open door. I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, that was fun. I hope you enjoyed the singing as much as I did. And I hope that uh, we were all lifted up by it and the Lord accepted our praise, the manner in which we gave it to him. Uh, the lesson this evening is kind of two-parted, so we'll see. Uh, hopefully it works out well and that uh, you will benefit from it. Uh, I uh, do want to share with you uh, something that I read that I thought was fascinating, especially coming from who it came from. And... Uh, just ponder for a moment uh, a couple of things. Uh, there was an American comedian who lived in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even into the 2000s. His name was George Carlin. 
Uh, some of his routines were somewhat irreverent, and uh, I won't go into any of that. But he was indeed a funny man. He was a thoughtful man, and uh, his comedy always reflected thoughtfulness many times about issues of the world. In early 2008, George Carlin's wife died. And in July of that same year, he died. And so George Carlin, this comedian of the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even into the early 2000s, wrote something very eloquent and so very appropriate. And I would like to share it with you this evening. The paradox of our time in history is that we have taller buildings, but shorter tempers, wider freeways, but narrower viewpoints. We spend more, but have less. We buy more, but we enjoy less. We have bigger houses and smaller families, more conveniences, but less time. We have more degrees, but less sense, more knowledge, but less judgment. We have more experts, yet more problems, more medicine, but less wellness. We drink too much, smoke too much, spend too much reckless, laugh too little, drive too fast, get too angry, stay up too late, get too tired, read too little, watch TV too much, and pray too seldom. We have multiplied our possessions, but reduced our values. We talk too much, love too seldom, hate too often. We've learned how to make a living, but not a life. We've added years to life, not life to years. We've been all the way to the moon and back, but having, but have trouble crossing the street to meet a new neighbor. We conquered outer space, but not inner space. We've done larger things, but not better things. We've cleaned up the air, but polluted the soul. We've conquered the atom, but not our prejudice. We write more, but learn less. We plan more, but we accomplish less. We've learned to rush, but not to wait. We build more computers to hold more information, to produce more copies than ever, but we communicate less and less. These are times of fast food and slow digestion, big men and small character, steep profits and shallow relationships. These are the days of two incomes, but more divorce, fancier houses, but broken homes. These are days of quick trips, disposable diapers, throwaway morality, one night stands, overweight bodies, and pills that do everything from cheer to quiet to kill. There is little time. There is so much in the showroom window and nothing in the stock room. A time when technology can bring this letter to you and a time when you can choose either to share the insight or just hit delete. Remember to spend more time with your loved ones because they are not going to be around forever. Remember, say a kind word to someone who looks up to you in awe because that little person soon will grow up and leave your side. Remember, give a warm hug to the one next to you because that is the only treasure you can give with your heart 
that doesn't cost a cent. Remember to say, I love you to your partner and your loved ones, but most of all, mean it. A kiss and embrace will mend hurt when it comes from deep inside of you. Remember to hold hands and cherish the moment for someday that person will not be there again. Give time to live, give time to speak, and give time to share the precious, precious thoughts of your mind. And always remember, life is not measured by the number of breaths we take, but those moments that take our breath away. I found those to be eloquent, eloquent words and words that in many ways we can live by. And with that in mind, I would like just to share a couple of thoughts with you. It would probably be good for you to turn to the book of 1 John because this is where a lot of this is going to come from. And the title of the rest of this lesson is Seven Reasons to Break Up with the World. We all know what breakups are, don't we? Corporations break up, marriages break up, relationships break up. The idea here for us to ponder is reasons that we ought to break up with the world. And so with that, we must perhaps ask ourselves the question, uh, what is our relationship with the world? And how far would we go to protect our relationship with the world? There are numerous times in Scripture that Jesus and his apostles usher a warning against this very topic. The Lord would comment in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, no one can serve two masters. We know the rest of that. Either he'll love one and hate the other or hate one and love the other. Paul would echo those sentiments in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23, where he said, whatever you do, do for the Lord. And so um, we are to live in this world, we are to do good deeds for people. But indeed, we're doing those good deeds for God. We, we remember and echo the words of Jesus when he said that you fed me and you clothed me and you gave me to drink. And they looked and, uh, at Jesus and said, I remember doing that. And he said, when you do the least to these, you do it to me. And that's part of what our relationship with the world ought to be about. And so as we move on, we're going to move into John, that is 1 John, and it is chapter 2. And we're going to start with verse 15. And I would like us to consider several things. First, in verse 15. He says, do not love the world, nor the things of the world. Do not love the world. We live in the world. We have no choice in this matter. But John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, do not love the world. God is the known source of all good and perfect things. Moreover, he's the one that created the world and its original state of godliness. It's man who separated himself from this goodness. God's methods and blessings are pure, whereas the world is filled literally with self-proclaimed corruption, as we read some of George Carlin's comments. And many of these are involved in uh, the desires of the flesh and the eyes and the pride of life. And so as we continue in First John, uh, 
chapter 2. Verse 17 says, the world is not eternal. The world is passing away and also its lusts and the one who does the will of God lives forever. When something comes from anywhere else outside of God, its quality is immediately subject to futility and decay. Such things will pass away. So first, the world is not from God. And two, the world is not eternal. If we go down to verses 18 and 19, it says, children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that, Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have appeared. And from this we know that it is the last hour. And they went out from us, and they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are not of us. What this is telling us is that the world when given opportunity, will betray us. And that's what I think John is talking about when he talks about the Antichrist, that desire pulled them out of God's family. Instead of being Christ-like, they became anti-Christ. And the world has a way of betraying the greatest pursuits that we can have in Jesus Christ. Let's look at verses 20 to 22. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. The world is limited in knowledge. You know what? The world has the same right to the truths that you and I as Christians have. And though through that, those that are found in God are found the way God wants us to be, are blessed with this knowledge that leads to eternal life. So by having the truth, one can find themselves in an assured state of peace because the world is of limited knowledge. Let's look at verse 23. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also, there are those in the world that will reject God. And carrying from the, you know, the previous context, John then speaks of those who do not allow the truth to abide in their lives. And as a result, they reject Jesus and they reject God and inherently by rejecting the plan of God altogether. And so the world rejects God. Let's look at verses 24 and 25. As for you, let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And if we go on, it says, this is the promise which he himself has made to us, eternal life. The world makes empty promises. And John very eloquently states to us, this is the promise given to us. God gives us the promise of eternal life. And as previously mentioned, the things in this life in the world are victims to corruption. 
people too often corrupt their lives with things that they should not corrupt it with. Why? Because the world makes empty promises. God makes the promise of eternal life. And finally, in verse 26, he says, These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. The world wants to pull us away from God. That is Satan's device. That is that roaring lion. It is the one that attempts to pull us from God. And the letter is making the point. The point is that its readers will not be distracted and pulled back into the world. This interference, and, and believe me, it's what it is when the world tries to grasp us. It tries to interfere with our relationship with God. This interference shows a very real and terrifying reality that the world has an ability to pull you away from the chief source of the goodness of life. Things to ponder. Reasons why we ought to break up with the world. Our relationship with the world is to bring them into the fold and not allow them to pull us out of it. We are God's children. And as God's children, we need to live our lives that way and not allow the world to corrupt us. Let's remember these points. The world is not from God. The world is not eternal. The world will betray. The world has limitations as far as knowledge is concerned. Many times the world rejects God. Surely the world makes empty promises. And lastly, if we allow it, the world will pull us away from God. We need to get as close to God as we can. And by that, we need to become children of God. We need to obey God into salvation. The scriptures point that out to us. The scripture said that we must hear and believe. And then we must, as we hear and believe, confess Jesus as the Son of God. We are to confess that Jesus is that Son of God and repent of our former lives and finally be baptized for the remission of your sins. This is the invitation that we give this evening. If you need to come to Jesus, it is time. If it is right now, if you would get in touch with us, we would help you in any way possible. Let's close with a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we understand that even though that we live in this world, we cannot be of this world. We understand that the world would pull us away. There are so many things out there that tempt us. And we understand that after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, and Jesus went up into the mountain and he was tempted by Satan. He rejected Satan. He rejected Satan by, by quoting the words of life. And we must do that also. We must have the words of life within us so that we will not allow the world to draw us from the Lord. Bless us this evening. Help us to take these words and, and make them uh, a, a part of our lives to ponder these things and make sure that we, even though we live in the world, do not become a part of the world. Bless us this evening. Be with us. Help us to look forward to that next time that we can be together. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all. Let me go.